Hi, hello all. I uh, hope you're all doing fine. Uh, just to briefly tell you about uh, our group, uh, we members of Rotary Fellowship of Wildlife was for Conservation share a common interest in wildlife and its conservation. Willing to work with the 119-year-old organization Rotary uh, towards building a future in which people and nature thrive. Uh, to share a few notes about our fellowship group, uh, we are a group of around 700 plus interested individuals who have globally united a common interest with the primary purpose to network and further friendship. Although our activities are conducted independently of Rotary International, they are in harmony with the Rotary policies. Our purpose is awareness about importance of wildlife to promote last friendships outside one's own club, district uh -huh. and country and to promote locally, regionally and globally that conservation of living resources are important to humans and future generations to enjoy our natural world and the incredible species that live within it. Today, we have uh, members uh, from different Rotary clubs and uh, friends of Rotary from different parts of the world as well. A very heart, hearty and a warm uh, welcome to each one of you. Uh, I'm also glad to announce that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, three chapters in all. Uh, so one is in India, and uh, one is in Argentina, uh, Latin America, and uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, on behalf of uh, all the wildlifers, I also extend a very, very warm welcome to our uh, speaker, uh, Ms. Paula, and uh, today we'll hear about energizing a co conservation movement uh, from her. Uh, so I request uh, Kalpa to briefly, uh, you know, introduce our uh, speaker to the audience. Over to you, Kalpa. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. Paula Kahumbu is a renowned Kenyan conservationist and award-winning wildlife filmmaker dedicating to energizing the conservation movement in Africa through the power of film and education. As the CEO of Wildlife Direct, she has spearheaded numerous initiatives to bring the beauty and plight of Africa's wildlife to global audience. Her groundbreaking series, Wildlife Warriors, and her work on Secrets of Elephants have captivated viewers, fostering a deep connection to nature and inspiring action. Through educational programs like Team Sayari, Dr. Kahumbu engaged thousands of children, empowering the next generation to lead conservation efforts. Her, in, her innovative approach seam, seamlessly blends storytelling with impactful outreach, making her a pivotal figure in the fight, of, fight to protect Africa's natural heritage. So we had Dr. Paula last year at our club. And uh, when we were talking with Sanjay, I said, yes, I have somebody who can give us a good talk. Welcome, Paula. Thank you. Thank you, I really appreciate it. And um, good evening to everyone, um, wherever you are. I'm in Nairobi, Kenya. It is now 5 p.m. The sun is getting low in the sky. It's actually quite lovely, it's warm been very cold for the last few days. Um, are we good to go? Super. Okay, uh, we'll just start with the first slide. So um, I am, um, I'm going to take you through a, a lightning speed uh, story about conservation in Kenya through my own experience. And um, I really would like to share with you why I do what I do. Some people think I'm crazy head is in the clouds, far too ambitious, much too passionate, too emotional. I get told all kinds of things. Um, and um, I think as a Kenyan, I'm very, very fortunate, very privileged to have been able to experience nature the way that I have. And it's something that I feel very, very passionate about sharing with other people, especially with fellow Africans. And as I go through the talk, I hope you'll get to understand and see more about why and also why it's so urgent what we're doing and what we need to do. While I'm going to be telling you it from my perspective, I, I really want you to know that this is a, a work of a whole team. I have a team of 
14 people who work with me. Um, they range from um, educators, filmmakers, managers, uh, scientists, lawyers, all kinds of people who collaborate with me in my office and also many other organizations beyond my office. So I, I might be saying me, I, I don't mean it that way. I mean, it's us, all of us. So uh, I work for Wildlife Direct. It's a conservation organization based here in Nairobi, Kenya. And we work across Africa, uh, primarily through our film work and our education work. And it was founded by the late Richard Leakey. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, I was born in Kenya, but my parents are from two very different worlds. My father was from the slopes of Mount Kenya, one of the first generation of educated Kenyans. He went to England to study engineering just before Kenya reached independence. And that's where he met my mother, Rosalind. My father's name is John. And they got married in England at a time when uh, it was illegal for a black man to marry a white woman in Kenya, but not in the UK. So they stayed in the UK until Kenya got independence and then they came back. And um, while they, that, what that means is that I was raised by my mother who was very English from a small village out in a place called Hereford. Um, my father was also from a village on the slopes of Mount Kenya where we still have our relatives who live um, in a rural farming community. So I really have two, two feet straddling these two very different worlds. Uh, next slide, please. I, I grew up just outside of the city of Nairobi and I was very, very lucky. I have a huge family, we're nine kids. And uh, I somebody asked me once, you know, when did you first get introduced to animals? And I actually couldn't remember apart from my siblings and all the weird, weird and wild pets that we used to have. But actually my father, it seems, was taking us out with my mother to see wild animals when we were very tiny. There I am still in my diapers meeting a giraffe. Uh, we also had lots of pets around the home and my mother's strategy to deal with nine very uh, active children was to lock the door and send us away and just say, just disappear, just go, get lost, <laughs> don't come back until mealtime. And what that meant is that uh, we grew up exploring and discovering everything in our neighborhood. We lived in a very wooded forested area with streams and hills and valleys and swamps and trees. So we were just really feral children. Um, we barely wore clothes. And, um, and this, I mean, at the time we might've thought we were a bit weird, but actually it is such an amazing and privileged way to grow up. It's very rare for children to have this experience where they just are safe in nature, enjoying it, climbing trees, uh, learning through discovering for themselves. And I think this had a very, very big impact on me for the rest of my life. Next slide. And although I made my name in studying elephants, that wasn't the animal that really grabbed my attention first. So in this part of Nairobi where I live, it's, there are all these trees all around me. And in the trees are these amazing tree hyraxes. This is an animal that is the size of a giant guinea pig. It's related to elephants. And when I was about five years old, I was walking down the road with my brother after we'd been out on a, you know, climbing trees and things. And we noticed this furry animal up in the top of the tree. And we stopped and we were watching it and trying to figure out what it was. It makes a very nasty screeching call. And a car drives up and stops. The, <laughs> the window goes down and this guy in the car with a very gruff voice says, what are you children doing? And we're like, wow, there's this animal up in the top of the tree. We were just so blown away by this creature. We'd never seen anything like it. And he told us what it was. It was Richard Leakey, who was our neighbor. And we didn't know him at all until this particular day. He told us about tree hyraxes, how amazing they are, how they are different from the rock hyraxes and um, that they're related to elephants. And he said, if you want to know anything about animals, come to my house, you know, and let uh, and ask me and so we did we would catch everything lizards snakes birds <laughs> whatever we could find geckos mice and we would go to Richard Leakey's house and ask him questions and he would always give us this incredible story about these animals where they live how they live and how we should return them back to the wild um 
again, I just, I don't know if anybody in Kenya has that kind of a neighbor anymore, where you can go and speak to an expert as a five-year-old, six-year-old child and have their attention. And they, they really care about you learning about these creatures. So the, this cool animal, the tree hyrax, uh, many of you um, may know about it because you see them when you come into Kenya or come into Africa. Uh, but I wonder if you know that this animal inspired Dr. Seuss and the book, The Lorax. The Lorax is actually a hyrax. It's just that he turned the name around. It's actually the, the Lorax is the Lorax. And he met this animal when he came to Kenya and was staying in um, the Abadez in a lodge where the tree, where the where the um, apartments are up in the canopy. And he saw this animal and he just fell in love with it. But he knew that the hyrax was in danger if the trees were lost. And so that's how he came up with the story called the Lorax. Next slide. So that's just a fun fact that you can share with other people. So. Although I met Richard Leakey when I was five, I continued my, I loved nature and I just pursued nature throughout my childhood, read every book I could, would go to libraries. And I went on expeditions as a kid. I don't know how, but I managed to get myself onto expeditions and go into the north of Kenya and hike in the wilderness. And when I reached the age of 17, I was completing high school. We didn't have money. I couldn't go to university. Um, my mother put me into secretarial college, which I really hated. I detested it. I, I thought it was torture. And uh, I ran away, myself and a friend of mine. We ran away from secretarial college and we ran to the National Museums of Kenya where Richard Leakey was the chairman. And he listened to me and he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I just want to go and look after lions and live in the wild. And, and um, he took me under his wing at the age of 17, got me at my first apprenticeship. Uh, working on primate research and I knew that that's it I just wanted to be a scientist I I was able from there to get great letters of reference got scholarships went to university in England did my bachelor's degree came back to Kenya started working in the Kenya Wildlife Service working on primates and then I moved to other animals and um, I did I did my master's degree on primates and then for my PhD I moved to elephants and um when I started studying elephants, it was because I felt for the first time that elephants had a chance. In the 1980s and 70s, elephants in Africa were declining so rapidly that I thought they were going to go extinct. I was convinced they were going to go extinct. And so I didn't study elephants for my master's degree. But after the initial burn of ivory in um, 1989, it everything turned around and it all happened because Richard Leakey pushed for this massive bonfire of ivory, which changed the whole world's perception of ivory and the value of ivory as um, trinkets and crafts and all that. Um, and so I decided that I would in fact study elephants for my PhD. It was something that uh, was not easy. Uh, studying elephants is dangerous. I um, the people who were already studying elephants were not exactly friendly to me, not very friendly. Some of them were amazing. Some of them didn't really want me in their field sites. And so I had to go and find my own research site. And I went to work in the south of Kenya, in the Shimba Hills, where we have this amazing population of savannah elephants that live in the mountains in a little patch of rainforest. And I was very interested and curious about how these animals could survive in a very tiny little physical space and how their social lives might change because they're not living out in the open, in the savannah, like all the other African elephants that had been studied up till that point. Next slide, please. Um, and so uh, I know that um, Asian elephants are extremely amazing. <laughs> the more we learn about Asian elephants and African elephants, the more we realize that we virtually know nothing. These animals are so intelligent their brains are so big, they have incredible memory. They migrate in Kenya, they migrate over thousands of kilometers and they will recall exactly where their footprints were. They can detect water 20 kilometers away. Um, they will take care of each other when they're sick. They laugh, they play, they create tools. They mourn their dead. Um, and many of these things are known, but as more and more research is being done, we're discovering they have names for each other. They have language. They actually have words in their communication and they can string together their words in the kind of a rudimentary language. And um, they 
probably have many, many more secrets than we can possibly imagine because our brains are not structured the same way as elephants' brains and they're nowhere near as big as an elephant's brain. So studying elephants was a phenomenal privilege and all I ever wanted to do was to stay out there in the wild, watching elephants, drawing them, identifying them and getting to know them. The amazing thing with elephants, any of you who have spent time, I'm sure all of you have seen an elephant or spent some time with elephants, the, the amazing thing about them is that they're also curious about humans. And if they're in a place where they feel safe, they'll be very calm and they will even get to know you. They will remember you and they will approach your vehicle, come very close, in some cases even touch you. So they're they're very special in, in ways that we can't even explain or describe. Um, so I fell in love with elephants and there's just there's just no coming back from that. You know, once you're in love with elephants, that's it. Your your life is committed to them. Next slide. And so while I was doing my research, poaching started up again. And this was as a result of a decision by countries around the world at one of the CITES or the Convention on Illegal Trade, uh, the Convention on Illegal Trade in, in um, uh, Flora and Fauna. At that convention, um, sorry, Convention on International, not Illegal, on International Trade, at that convention, it was decided that Southern African countries could sell their ivory to Japan at one point and then Japan and China. Um, you can imagine what that was like. China is a country of, uh, I don't know, 1.6 billion people. And they are people who attach a lot of value to ivory. And so when the when that ivory sale took place, it just opened the floodgates. The price of ivory shot through the roof because the Chinese economy was also booming. Everybody could afford some ivory, and so everybody wanted some ivory. Uh, what that led to was a massive slaughter of elephants across Africa. And at the time, I was doing my PhD, and I called Richard Leakey, and I said, you know, um, you need to, we need to do something. And he asked me to take two years out of my PhD and help him to, to help try and rein the situation in. Um, we, we did prevent the trade from reopening for um, a few years, but eventually the, the trade did take place, massive amount of trade between uh, four Southern African countries, China and Japan, which led to an explosion of poaching in about 2014. And this was at that point, I'd finished my PhD, I'd done a whole bunch of other things, um, but this situation was a crisis. We could see not just a single elephant being killed, like in this case, this is in the Maasai Mara, we just wouldn't expect to see this, a place which has tourists driving all over the place and somebody had the audacity to go and shoot dead an elephant and remove its tusks. And all the other bull elephants were hanging around near that elephant because that's their relative and they tried to help him. And of course, what that means is that all the elephants will tend to gather and they're stressed and they'll be um, you know, communicating with each other, rumbling, and basically they are very easy targets for poachers when they're in that state of distress. Next slide. And so at that time, I had just come back to work with Richard Leakey and I was struggling to figure out how are we going to address this problem? It couldn't be a situation where we have to wait for the rest of the world to catch up with us because the rest of the world had just given the order for the ivory trade to take place. So we thought we're going to take matters into our own hands. We are going to uh, launch a campaign in Kenya. Although the poaching was happening all across Africa, we decided we're going to take it on in Kenya and launch a campaign and mobilize Kenyan people against the poachers. Um, the, the campaign was called Hands Off Our Elephants. And we did this campaign in the name of this particular family of elephants. These are the QBs, QB being letters of the alphabet, Q and B. That's a family in Amboseli. Uh, all the elephants in this family's names begin with the letter Q. So that's Kumquat, she's the matriarch. Her daughter, Quay, and her other daughter, Quintilla, they had a son called Q-Tip and a baby daughter called Kwanza. That was um, Kumquat's granddaughter. This family of elephants were very famous. They were very easy to approach, very calm, very relaxed. They have phenomenal tusks, like many of the elephants in Amboseli. These are elephants that had not been poached. 
They're very, they've been researched for 50 years. They're totally tolerant of people. You can drive right up to them. And Nick Brandt, the photographer, literally would get out of his car, lie down on the ground and photograph them as they stand there feeding, grazing, rumbling. You know, they're just so calm and relaxed. And the day after he took this photograph, the entire family was wiped out. They were all shot. All the ivory was taken, except little baby Kwanzaa, who was so tiny, she didn't really have any tusks worth taking. So they didn't bother to waste a bullet on her. But this, this particular incident was so upsetting for us. And we, because we knew these elephants by name, we knew their relatives, we knew their friends, we knew who their sons and daughters were, um, that we were able to make this a, uh, I guess, a very emotional point for all Kenyans. And I went on radio, went on TV and talked about this particular family of elephants and mobilized the general public to join us. Next slide. And this campaign was very successful. It wasn't just the general public that got excited. Kenya's first lady at the time, Margaret Kenyatta, called me to her office and she wanted to know, she was very distressed, very, very distressed about what was happening. She's an extremely emotional person. And she said, what can I do to help you? And I said, well, would you be the patron of this campaign? She said, of course I would, you know, what do you need me to do? And, you know, I'm a scientist. And I was like, had all kinds of crazy wild ideas. And then I, but then I said to her, um, you know, have you, how much time have you spent with elephants? And she said, well, I saw some when I was five. This is a very typical thing in Kenya. Most Kenyans have not even seen an elephant. I've never been into a national park with elephants. And those who have interacted with elephants, mostly it's very negative. Elephants raiding your farm, elephants uh, destroying your property, trampling on your crops and that kind of thing. So my, the first thing I did was I said, we've got to get you out into Amboseli. You've got to meet these elephants yourself. So she came with us. We spent a, a day in the in the wild, driving around. Um, she had uh, a whole entourage of her estate people around her because she was the president's wife. And um, at about six o'clock at night, her minister was saying, you know, uh, Your Excellency, we have to leave. You know, the helicopters have to go back to Nairobi. And she said, I'm not going back. I'm staying. You know, you guys can go. I'm not going back. She didn't have a toothbrush, a change of clothes, nothing. She stayed for an extra day, found found room for her in a hotel. But she just spent the whole time watching elephants, just fell in love with elephants. And this is the power that elephants have over people. And that's what we wanted to bring to the campaign to really get everyone to um, go after the bad guys, the poachers, the traffickers, the dealers, and the consumers of ivory. Uh, next slide. And so this is what we did. We mobilized every year a massive march in the streets of Nairobi. We had over 4,000 people marching with us. It was unbelievable. People were flying in from other East African countries to join us and march on the streets and demand for justice for nature. This was um, an amazing moment for me, particularly because I didn't understand why so many people would come. They came from all corners of the country and I would walk among this crowd and ask people, what made you come? And they said, this is the only thing I can do to show how much I care. It's the only contribution I can make towards elephants. And it made me think, wow, there's this huge opportunity that we're not tapping. All these people care. They have so much passion for this wildlife. They, many of them have never seen an elephant, but here they are willing to spend a whole day, walk for 15 kilometers, just to send a message to the president of Kenya that we have to stamp out the poaching. And the purpose of these marches was we were going after one particular criminal. His name was Faisal Muhammad Ali, an ivory trafficker who was associated with a two ton seizure of ivory in Mombasa down in the port at the coast. And he was oh, just such a, he was a, a, the kind of criminal you read about in stories that you don't believe exists in real life. The kind of guy who is so vicious, he will eliminate witnesses. He will destroy evidence. He will corrupt and bribe the judges, the prosecutors. Um, he was a terrible, terrible guy. And we had decided that that's the guy we're going to go after. That's the guy we're going to bring to book because he's going to be the demonstration and the proof of what citizen action can do. Next slide, please. So here's the guy, <laughs> Faisal Muhammad Ali. 
At the time, I had never even met him, but I hired a team of lawyers and we provided backup support for the Kenyan prosecutor because Faisal had three lawyers working on his behalf. And these lawyers were threatened. They had, they were uh, shot at. Uh, I mean, it was insane. It was insane what was, what was going on. The case was restarted three times, three different judges, because he kept interfering with the evidence, the files, the, the witnesses. And in the end, um, one of the judges just had had enough. And she said, that's it. And she convicted him and he went to jail. He was jailed for 20 years, although he did get out after three years. Um, but he is, I think, one of the um, most prominent and um, most vivid demonstrations of what civil society can do, especially when we collaborate with government. But it wasn't always easy because, you know, fighting against, even if you're fighting against a poacher or a trafficker, somebody like Faisal, you know this person has corrupted government officials. And so when you're going after somebody like this, who has found it so easy to be dealing in ivory, killing elephants and getting away with it, tra transporting these products all across the continent, moving across international borders, there's no way they can be doing it if they don't have friends in government who have been protecting them from the police to the wildlife authorities, the transport authorities, the, you know, you name it, the, the um, border post people, all that. Um, next slide. And so as a result, uh, you know, of going after Faisal, people came after me too. They started attacking me. They started accusing me of being an ivory dealer, of being involved in um, poaching elephants, of moving ivory for the president. There was all kinds of insane attacks against me and my character because people thought that if I uh, could be brought down, the campaign would dissolve and disappear. Next slide. They, uh, this is this is one particular guy who is, he's got a huge following in Kenya. He's a big influencer, who actually started a whole story about you know Paula Kahumbu is a poacher. Um, she supports conservationists. We are con con people. Um, and what I thought was so interesting is how the narrative can turn so quickly. You know, we were there. We were creating a narrative about how valuable elephants are, how important they are to us as a country part of our identity, part of our culture. And this guy was trying to twist it all and reverse, reverse everything we were trying to, to do and say. Next slide. So these are the kind of challenges that we've been facing when in fact, they are very much a distraction from, from everything. But when you have a population of people who, who don't know themselves as conservationists, uh, it's easy for those kinds of narratives to take root. And I say this because conservation in Africa has been very much dominated by people from the West. Scientists like Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, David Attenborough, uh, who come to Africa and have done this amazing work with George Schaller. And um, they have fantastic access to media and visibility, the press. Uh, and the whole world thinks that these are the people who are saving Africa's wildlife. And what that does is doesn't just boost them, their work and funds, but it also undermines in the psyche of Africans their view of themselves in conservation. And this is something that I felt quite strongly because if you're in England and um, there's a David Attenborough series on, everybody in England loves him. He's a national icon. There's no question that David Attenborough is beloved by every single person in England. And as a result of his work and his messages, England has one of the most environmentally conscious populations in the world. People are saving bumblebees and butterflies in their gardens at home. And you don't see that in, in parts of the global South in particular. And I think, I believe it's because we don't have content that is really directed at us. Although 40 wildlife documentaries are made in Kenya every year, they're not seen on Kenyan television. They're not seen by Kenyans. And if you're not consuming that content, you're not seeing it, you're not seeing yourself in those images, you don't see the possibilities for, for it either. So even when I went into conservation, people started asking me, are you trying to be a white person? Are you trying to be like Jane Goodall? You know, it's like, it was like my whole identity was questioned. Why would somebody like me, an African, want to get into conservation? Am I trying to be 
better than my colleagues. You know, it was, it's a really, really tough space to be in. And so I decided that we have to change this narrative. We have to draw on the storytelling um, power, the power of storytelling to really enlist all Africans in conservation. And if all Africans care about nature and conservation, then we'll be able to save this wildlife. But if the only people who really care about wildlife are people from the West, because they've been watching these amazing documentaries, um, then it will always be a struggle and, and it may not succeed. Next slide. And this matters enormously because Africa is also facing so much, um, so many threats because of climate change. This is the drought which took place just a couple of years ago. I traveled around Kenya with a crew from National Geographic to document what was happening. I mean, it's unbelievable devastation and it's not just wildlife. It's also livestock and people's lives are being destroyed. And this is because the land has been degraded to such a point that it's literally added, takes a little bit of a drought for things to reach a tipping point. After this drought, we then had those rains and floods that we were talking about earlier. Um, so the, the ability of the land to tolerate these climate changes and, and uh, climatic events is literally, you know, on a razor edge. We are literally facing what I call an ecological emergency. Next slide. And that, of course, leads to more poverty. And so this is happening because of massive expansion of uh, change in land use, agriculture, fencing, which is preventing animals from migrating. And another really big problem is human wildlife conflict. The picture on the left is a picture of a lioness who had been killed just south of Nairobi National Park. So Nairobi Park has about 45 lions. Those lions sometimes leave the park, they go into the neighboring areas and they go after livestock. And in this particular place, a whole pride of lions was killed. This lioness, her sisters and all their cubs. And all the schools were closed and children were brought to see their first lion. These are children who live on the edge of a national park, right near the city of Nairobi. And this was one of the most heartbreaking moments. So these kids, this is the education they're getting. They're not getting the David Attenborough fall in love with nature. They're getting a totally different story. Their single story is animals are bad, they're dangerous, the only good lion is a dead lion. So this is what we felt we really must interrupt through a new form of storytelling. Next slide. And this new form of storytelling must inspire, not just like make you feel good. It mustn't just like feel, make you feel awe. It's got to make you move to action. That's what we really believe in. And so we went off to look for uh, success stories. And you don't have to look far in, in Kenya. Kenya is a country full of brilliant, innovative people. So here's Richard Turere. I met him when he was 13 years old. And he had invented a flashing light system to keep lions out of his father's um, stockade. Richard could barely speak English. He lived in a, a very rural area. And his job was to look after his father's cows. When he made this invention, he was quiet about it. No. He didn't tell anyone about it. In fact, somebody else came to and told me that you Kenyans are crazy. You have this brilliant genius who lives among you and you don't even know about him. And that's when I went out to see him. And his invention was truly surprising for a 13-year-old to have designed something that mimics a person walking around at night. So a lion thinks that you're awake when in fact you're fast asleep. And he did it because he just wanted to sleep. He wanted to go to school the next day and he had been missing school. Richard, as a result of his invention, which is now patented, he was the youngest patented Kenyan. Um, he got a he got to talk on the TED stage in Los Angeles when he was still 13. He travels all over the world talking about his invention. He's published his own book. He's now got a, a bachelor's degree in conservation leadership. And he is just a, a superstar in conservation. So these are the kind of young people who really can inspire uh, fellow Africans to feel um, that they have potential, that they can make a difference as individuals, and that they actually must take those actions. Next slide. And so on the back of the success of the Hands Off for Elephants campaign, the success of Richard Terere's amazing story, I decided to 
changed my career completely from doing you know pure conservation and advocacy to using media as a very powerful tool for advocacy. So storytelling as a tool for advocacy. And I launched a show called First Team Sayari, which was, sorry, First NTV Wild, which is on one of the television channels. It was very successful, but I didn't have the IP. I couldn't control the IP. So I started my own show called Wildlife Warriors. And the goal of this programming was to not only tell our own stories about our own conservation heroes and role models, women and men on the front line, but to also make the films by an African crew. When I started, I had no idea how difficult this would be. As I said earlier, Kenya is, uh, we have 40 blue chip, that is like top level international films made in Kenya every year on wildlife. Not one of them is made by Africans. In fact, all those crews that fly into the country fly in with all their gear, all their interns, all their everything, their equipment, and then they leave. Immediately they finish shooting. There is no transfer of knowledge. There is no job creation. There is uh, nothing left behind, no footage left behind even. And as a result, um, nobody in the country even knows anything about wildlife filmmaking. So we were the first wildlife filmmakers of color in Africa. And we only started in 2015. It just seems insane. When I look at a country like India, you have so many amazing uh, Indian filmmakers producing incredible content. And it's it's really guts me that uh, it took us a very long time to get around to doing it ourselves. But I started this production with a, a team um, from a local production company. And since then I've trained many, many other people and I'll tell you a bit more about it. But this series, Wildlife Warriors, has been hugely successful. And um, Sanjay, I don't know if you'll be able to, but I did drop the link to Team Sayari in your in the chat to you. I don't know if you'll be able yes, to show yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. If you I, could just I, show that. It's a, yeah, I will reshare. Show a little clip. Yeah, thank you. Would you like to make share it now? Yeah, if we could just watch it now, just so that you can get a sense of the of the series. So I've also shared the link to uh, Richard's uh, TED Talk. I had a, an opportunity to see that a uh, while ago. Um, yeah, Rashmi, uh, can you see? I have, I've just shared. Yeah, I've. I think I've opened the TED talk that you've shared. No, no, the next one. The next one. The Vimeo file. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Just give me a second. So this this will just give you a taste of uh, the kind of productions that we make. I think it stopped, Rashmi. Um, Sorry, was it late? I, I think it stopped when I did the full screen so I just wanted to check yeah it stopped playing okay uh, just a sec are we going to try again or yes yeah, she's yeah And we're on our way to Kanika Island. This time, we're looking for Pombo. Dolphins. In the northern reaches of the Kenyan coast are over 60 islands. This is the Lamu Archipelago. 
I've just arrived in Old Pejeda Conservancy. If you closely look at them, you can see those prehistoric attributes. She's so big. Oh, she's beautiful. Warrior's favorite scratch is behind her ears. Bram, come here. Boy, good boy. Come on, boy. Even in the safest of sanctuaries, life as a lion is still tough. So we've been tracking lions this morning, and these footprints are going to lead us to exactly where this lion made this game. Wow, there are so many. While it's quite sad that a giraffe has died today, its death has led to the renewal of more life. Less than a kilometer away is one of the most diverse ecosystems on Earth, the coral reef. There's such magical places to find, and that's why it's so important that I want to conserve this area. If we're going to save Africa's wildlife, we need many more warriors. Thank you for that. Uh, maybe we can go back to those slides. So I was very excited when I met uh, Akansha Sood, who is an Indian filmmaker who makes a series called On the Brink, which is, funnily enough, very similar to Wildlife Warriors. So Wildlife Warriors has 13 episodes per season. We've done two seasons so far, and I have seasons three and four um, ready to go as soon as we get enough funding to start production. The uh, first two seasons were filmed entirely in Kenya, partly because of COVID and the next two seasons will film across East Africa. And they really feature African conservation heroes and heroines at the front line. And, and some of them are very unlikely heroes. So for example, um, uh, somebody like uh, um, Nora and Katito are research scientists. They are assistants to Cynthia Moss, who's got the longest running elephant research in the world. Uh, but you also have uh, a young man who's an accountant who turned to become a an amazing turtle rescuer down at the Kenyan coast or a young man who was an engineer who became a just fascinated with recording the sounds of whales down also at the north of the Kenyan coast so lots of amazing people top scientists engineers um, artists business people tour guides tour operators community people are the heroes and heroines of this series and the reason why I did that is because I really want everyone to know that conservationists can come from any background. You don't have to have a PhD or a science background. Next slide. And I especially wanted to show uh, some of the animals that people really are scared of, snakes and bats, for example. Um, so this, the episode on bats with Paul Webala, who is a, an African or world-renowned bat expert, was an amazing quest to find the big five of the bats. So Kenya has over 120 different species of bats. And we went off exploring caves that had more bats in them than there are wildebeest in the entire Serengeti. So we, we really pull out some amazing locations and facts and stories on, uh, on the backstories, especially of some of these incredible people whose families sometimes thought they were crazy going into this work or, or tried to persuade their young <laughs> young children to not do conservation, that there's no money in it, that there's no career in this. Um, but it's a it's a career that attracts people who are super passionate about animals, plants, and, and these amazing places. Next slide. Uh, next slide. And in one of the stories we did, which was, I think, maybe my most favorite, was a story uh, filmed on the top of a mountain where there is a community of people who are the caretakers of the forest, and they believe in the magic of trees. They talk to the trees, they believe trees can communicate with each other, and that they can speak the language of the trees. And as a result, they've been able to protect um, this incredible 
piece of rainforest for hundreds of years. Um, and uh, while I was there, they taught me about traditional, med you know, herbal medicines and um, I don't know how they how they listen to nature. It was it was absolutely fantastic. These are the most important stories that we should be recording and telling because many of these tribes and these peoples and this knowledge is disappearing as younger people are going to school and they're not uh, staying in these locations and learning from their parents and grandparents. Next slide. So this particular tribe is really amazing. They, they believe in numbers. And he was, uh, in his hand is a, um, a bunch of stones. They are small pebbles that are poured out of a gourd that has been handed down to him from several generations of grandparents. There are 400 stones in the gourd and he knows each and every pebble by its look and feel. And what they do is they they shake the, the good and they pour it out and then they read those stones. And as I was sitting with him and talking to him, um, I was telling him, you know, why I had come to talk to him. And he said, but I knew you were coming. And I said, how did you know? He said, because the stones had told me. I already knew that you were coming and I already knew that you had a, a good heart and that you're somebody that we should accept. Because they often reject people who come to, um, you know, listen to them or document what they're doing. Next slide. Oh, next slide. So now we have this amazing content and all these incredible stories. Um, we wanted to know what Kenyans think about it. So we broadcast our series on national television. Citizen TV reaches about um, probably 30% of the people in Kenya. Our surveys show that 50% of Kenyans, or at least 50% of Kenyans have watched the series. And we go back into the communities, into schools, into universities, into um, you know homesteads, and we talk to people about the show and uh, what the show means to them. And it's it's phenomenal how um, how much pride people have in the series because they see themselves. If we're recording local people, we always record them in their own languages, which is uh, such a powerful way of creating relatedness among people. And we were trying to find out, so what would it take to create a generation of wildlife warriors? We were recording all these people who already made it, but how do we create a generation of wildlife warriors? And this was a really incredible exercise. Uh, next slide. Uh, what we found out from so many people is that young people want to be in nature, young Kenyans. They want to be out in the wild. They wanted to go into the national parks. They want to do research and science, not pretend science, but real science. Um, they want to be able to go there with their parents and they want to make sure that elderly people and people with different abilities should also have access to the protected areas and to experience um, wildlife and nature. Next slide. And because of this, we decided that we had to uh, make a very special effort to bring children into conservation. The the event that we held was called an open space event, and it was it came out so clearly that the group of Kenyans who really missed access to nature and who could benefit the most was children. So we started Wildlife Warriors Kids, and we started taking children out into the national parks and on expeditions from the age of eight. Children could come camping with us for up to five days in the wild, learn about nature, go out in trucks, do research, learn about plants, count animals, participate in national counts and that kind of thing. Next slide. Um, and this is this is what the camps look like. Uh, they learn about being outdoors, putting up their tents, collecting specimens, doing photography and storytelling, um, and of course, documenting um, animals using technology. So one of the most exciting things is a technology of uh, individual identification for zebra using an AI kind of a tool. You can actually read the stripes of a zebra like a barcode. And that means kids can participate. All you've got to do is take a photograph of a zebra and the software will tell you which zebra it is. It's really, it's really phenomenal. It's a great way to get kids who may not be that excited about the zebra, the animal, which is just a common animal that looks like every other zebra. The moment you realize it's unique, it's got this unique pattern and you can identify what that unique pattern is, then you become really interested in the individual animals. And that's where we start getting this uh, great love and 
um, attention and interest and empathy for nature. Next slide. Uh, we also bring our kids out to meet their role models. They could be the scientists, the researchers, the rangers, the, the artists, the tour guides, tour operators, and that kind of thing. Um, this is this I think is really exciting, and many of the kids who we started off with are now getting into high school, and some of them are coming back to us as as volunteers and interns and young people who are even doing degrees now in conservation. So this is super exciting and super impactful work. Next slide. But what we did notice was that whenever we took kids out, we have to take them out with their teachers. We found that the teachers would take a back seat. They would literally back away from what was going on and let us handle the kids. And that meant that their engagement with nature was only high quality when we were there. And other than that, the teachers didn't really do much with them. It was because teachers themselves have never spent time in nature either. They've never had the privilege of going on an expedition themselves or you know, doing ge geography on a field trip or learning about how to hug a tree or how to take a photograph, how to use a pair of binoculars. So we actually have shifted our program significantly and we focus a lot now on teachers taking teachers out into the wild. And so it's just teachers from many different schools who are brought together, taken off on a wild adventure for several days uh, where they learn to draw, they learn to do art, they learn to do journaling, nature journaling. They learn how to identify different species, how to press plants and that kind of thing. And this means that they now have all the tools to keep these programs going in the schools. Next slide. Uh, this was a a drawing class, a nature journaling class, actually with an Indian artist called Pooja Gupta. She's phenomenal, if you don't know her, she's amazing. And she zoomed in from India in the middle of COVID and taught all these, I think there were 30 or 40 teachers, how to draw and interpret nature. Next slide. Um, one of the outcomes of all this work is that we got noticed by Disney, um, Disney and National Geographic, who thought it was really exciting that we were producing content specifically for children. And they um, joined us in the creation of a new series called Team Sayari, a very different kind of a series. This time it was uh, much better funded by USAID and a series where we said, we don't want to be uh, Paula presenting um, or adults presenting, it was all led by kids. So we, we hired 14 children from five different African countries. And these kids basically go on um, a quest to solve problems in every episode. There are 20 episodes and it was filmed in Nigeria, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and South Africa. Um, and these kids literally um, in, in becoming, they really joined us as talent. They were not necessarily conservationists. But by the end of the filming, which took about eight months, these kids have become, you know, the most phenomenal champions for conservation. And we're going to be spending a day with them this week in Nairobi National Park, together with teachers from Kenya, Tanzania and Rwanda to discuss the success of this program. So the 20 episodes, it's a magazine show. It's fun. It's available on um, National Geographic Africa YouTube channel. There are 20 episodes. And the episodes, the kids go off to cool places like the Ngorongoro Crater and they meet a scientist and they ask questions and they have to solve a problem um, for the whole group of kids to, to figure out some, you know, on some quest. It's a, it was a really exciting program shot entirely by an African crew, produced locally. I designed the show. I uh, identified all of the stories and... Um, um, it was just, I don't know, one of the most exciting pieces of work that we've done. But we didn't want to just produce content. We wanted to make sure that this content translates into real practical lessons for kids. So the whole show was designed around real problems, real issues that families face in Africa, particularly those people who live in high biodiversity areas adjacent to national parks or in forests and that kind of thing and real solutions. So the kids go off and they meet somebody who's actually doing real, it could be um, waste recycling. And as a, as a consequence, they're learning something practical, something that could be economical. And there's a DIY segment in every single episode. So kids in every episode can 
finish the show and know how to do something, how to make something. It could be a birdhouse or or a, a little pond in a bottle, that kind of thing. Um, next slide. And the theory of change of this show was um, uh, was thought through at, in great depth with between us, National Geographic, Disney, USAID, Department of the Interior, uh, State Department. It was like a whole bunch of different organizations got together to think through what could this theory of change look like for it to work. The idea being that we, if we give children amazing content that is fun and entertaining, and it's also educational, and if their teachers make sure that the kids watch the content and are, are supported in doing activities, and not just in school, but in their homes and in the community, and if we provide them with some incentives, so prizes, T-shirts, um, micro grants, then they will participate in conservation actions. So this was our theory of change. It's it's actually really simple, and it might seem really obvious, but every single part of it was really we had to work very hard to see and make sure that all of our assumptions were correct. Um, as a result of this theory, of, using this theory of change, producing the show in a, in the way it was produced, it had to be accessible to children which meant it even had to be translated into the local languages. When we started, we didn't realize how important that was. And in fact, it cost us a huge amount of money to go back and redo it and dub it in the languages so that it could be accessible in certain parts of East Africa. Um, but as a result, these kids now have this incredible content, which is designed for them. There are books, manuals, guides, teachers' activities, and, and uh, further activities that kids can do, plus grants that the kids can apply for. So the kids write project proposals and we are, we give money to the school for the kids to do activities in the schools. And we have 87 schools um, that have now done projects, um, incredibly successful. Some of them are amazing, you know, producing honey. One of them has a pollinator garden. Others are doing things like uh, recycling, cleaning up nature, uh, cleaning up their rivers in their areas. Um, all kinds of interesting projects. And these are small kids. Their average age is 10 years old. So it's super exciting to see that so much impact has um, emerged from one program. And we have so far reached 12,000 children, or just over 12,000 children in Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda. Um, and I said that the, the, the funding is now coming to an end, and we've in, invited all of the teachers from Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda to come together and work together on um, reviewing the success as we consider what will season two look like. Next slide, please. This is what it looks like. So we're not talking of private schools in Kenya, we're talking of public schools, where in some cases they can put up a screen. Many of them have a, a computer only or a, a tiny little screen that they're watching the films on. And sometimes they're just packed in there. They're clubs, these are after school programs. So up to 50 children in a group watching these films. Next slide. And these are just some illustrations of the kind of activities the kids get up to afterwards. Um, there, many of them do farming projects, pollination gardens. Some of them have rescued animals. Uh, many of them are planting trees. It's, it's really, really exciting. Next slide. And uh, and I just want to end with um, one of the most exciting things that ha happened also as a result of getting noticed for this work that we've been doing in schools and with children. Um, a colleague of ours lost their mother th who owned some land just south of Nairobi National Park. Now, anyone who's been to Nairobi, you know that Nairobi Park is this extraordinary gem right in the city. It's 117 square kilometers, so 15% of the city is wilderness. And it is really wild. It has over 500 species of birds alone. Rhinos, giraffes, buffaloes, hippos, crocodiles, oh, you name it, it's amazing. Um, and this woman had land just south of the National Park. And when she passed away, her family said, uh, we want to give it to you so that you guys can use it for whatever you want that's conservation oriented. So we said, okay, we're gonna create the first children's conservation, Afri conservation area in Africa. So the Wildlife Warriors Kids Field Lab, which is where that red blob is, 
um, is a wilderness area. Next slide. It's it's incredible because it is a truly wild place. We don't have any built infrastructure. Everything is in tents. Children watch their films inside the tent when they come and visit us. And last year we had 4,500 children visit us. Next slide, please. And then after that, they go off into nature. And the idea for us is their job is to explore, discover, and have fun. And so they all go off. They're given a few simple tools, magnifying glasses, binoculars, maybe a camera or an iPad. And uh, these kids are aged from five up to 15. They go off and they explore. And um, we have scientists, um, rangers, and people who stay with them, make sure that they're safe. But for many of these kids, they come from, um, what would you call, I'm going to call them slums in Kenya. They're really uh, terrible, terrible locations where it's just mud and litter and waste and dirt and stinkiness all around them. And they come to the Wildlife Warriors Field Lab and there are birds singing. It's green. There are flowers. There are beautiful trees. There's lots of fruit. Um we have hippos, crocodiles. Um, we even have rhinos, black rhinos and white rhinos on our property. And the kids can look at footprints and they can uh, follow the trail of various animals and spend a day with us, um, which is uh, a massive uh, difference. It's, it's even better than being inside a national park because they can touch things, they can feel them, they can listen to things, they can pick them up, they can sometimes taste them. There are some of these plants are actually edible or medicinal. So there's loads of great things they can do, including um, planting trees and leaving their mark on the place as well. Next slide. Um, uh, Nairobi Park is special for something that very few people know. It has over a hundred species of grass and it making it a biodiversity hotspot for, for grasses. So children learn all the names of different grasses. We have 40 different species on this little patch of land that we have, that we've identified so far. So grasses are really simple and easy because when you press them, they're already dry um, and they're very easy to tell apart because the, the seed heads are very different from one from the other. And this is a really fun and exciting way of getting kids interested in identifying different species. Next slide. And then from time to time, we take the kids out, uh, the kids who are particularly outstanding. So here are two young men, Castro and his cousin, Larry, who are two of our top uh, wildlife warriors. And we took them to a place called Navasha, where we did a photo photography boot camp for kids. And what I, I just love this photograph because this is Castro taking a selfie with a monkey and his cousin, Larry, who's 10, is showing the monkey its photograph. So these kids have a way of um, interpreting what we've been teaching them that is always so surprising. You never really know what what you left behind. But when you see a kid thinking that, you know, these monkeys need to see their own photographs, I thought that was just so cute. And the monkey's literally looking at his own photograph. It was so cute. Um, next slide. Um, so some of the work we're doing now is moving towards having a badge system, a little bit like a, um, scouts something so the kids can earn points in different kinds of areas. This is a, a really fun, fun, cool project. We haven't started it yet. We're still working on this. Uh, next slide. And um, and finally, what we really want to go to next is do to build up this infrastructure of the field lab. We've been there for just over a year. Our staff still live in tents. Everything is under tents, canvas. And we want to put in a proper structure where we will have um, an outdoor cinema in the bush for kids uh, and their families. So parents can come as well because the kid, we're, in, we're really in a rural community area. Uh, have a campsite where kids can come and pitch their tents, have dorms for those kids who are not going to be in tents, um, kitchen areas, and of course the staff quarters. So that now kids can come and do multi-day events with us, not just at the moment, it's just they come for a day. And I am so excited to tell you that I just went to the Kenya Wildlife Service today and I said to them, you know, we are adjacent to the park. The river is between us and the park and you could see the kids walking across those stones. Literally, they could walk into the national park if they wanted to, um, but we can't drive into the national park because there's no roads there. And so I went to them, to the KWS this morning, uh, actually this afternoon, just before I came here, I was worried I'd missed this call because I really wanted them to impress on them how important it is that children can access the park and the field lab. 
And the warden was just amazing. He was like, he said, of course we can do that. You know, we're going to cut a track from one of the main roads in the national park. We'll cut a track so that your buses can enter the national park at the main gate, take the children on a tour of the park, drive down to the river, get out of their bus, cross the river, hopping across those stones, and they'll be in the field lab and we'll complete the day at the field lab and then they drive back through the park, back to their school. So just it'll just transform the whole experience for them to be able to drive up to lions and rhinos and giraffes um, after having also been doing all this hands-on stuff. You know, I think it'll be a really, really incredible addition to the experience that these children are having. So that's it for me, guys. I was just wanted to share with you what we've been doing, the challenges we've had, the successes, and uh, the dream that, that we want to achieve next. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. It was really wonderful. Uh, I think I'll I'll uh, hand it over to Vikram. Vikram, you can see if there are any questions in the chat box. Uh, if, if if there is anyone who wants to ask any question directly, please uh, use the ra raise hand option. Uh, okay. So, yeah, we'll call you one by one. Thanks. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you, Sanjay. Paula, uh, on behalf of everyone here and wildlife flowers everywhere, um, heartfelt gratitude to you. For all that you've done, um, all that you continue to do, I'm actually joking up as I say this. Uh, thank you so much. Um, you know, I think some of these questions reflect uh, myself wanted to ask, so I'll actually move on to them uh, because I think those questions are here. And I think the most popular question that's come up in chat uh, has been, how do people become part of the storytelling? How do they do this? Uh, this question is from uh, Swathi and Siddharth, uh, who've been in Kenya before. They've lived in Kenya. They travel there often. So they wanted to know um, how can they get involved in the storytelling? Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. What a wonderful question. And I'm so sorry. I can see now it's sorry, suddenly the sun is so bright over here. Um, um, we, we actually advertise whenever we have courses, trainings, um, boot camps, and uh, we actually do filming camps as well. We advertise, and these are very, very um, competitive. We get lots of people from all over the world actually wanting to come on our courses. We sometimes film in the Masai Mara or down at the coast or around Nairobi. Um, but we have a website, wildlifedirect.org. We also, we also have a lot of content on our social media handles as well as mine. So you can always find us. You can always find out what we're what we're doing. We post everything there. So so please do um, monitor that, and and alternatively write to me directly. So because we do have trainings coming up um, on opportunities for young people to join us in the field. We work with professional filmmakers. Uh, we're, we're particularly interested in um, people who are already mid career filmmakers. That we don't we haven't been working so much with starters. Uh, you know early career people. We've been working primarily with people who already have good knowledge of cameras and and filming, and we, they just haven't had the experience to be in the wild filming nature. But I, today I spent some time with the county of Nairobi talking to them about the need for the film schools in Nairobi to adopt wildlife filmmaking and for the tourism departments to also adopt wildlife filmmaking and storytelling as part of their courses. So I think this is going to be an area for growth for us as well. Thank you so much. Um, I was just chatting with a couple of uh, filmmaker friends of mine. I believe you know them well, Rana and Sugandhi. And they were telling me they had introduced me to you on uh, email as well. I, I was trying to, there's something that Sanjay and I are working on. So we will definitely be in touch with you again soon. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I'll just take another question from chat before I move to Ayman uh, uh, to directly ask. And this is a very pertinent question for, I think, for the entire uh, what we know call as the global south uh, we have <clears throat> extremely rapidly you know increasing populations everywhere in africa and across asia uh, we're seeing in india and uh, we also read much about this problem in africa about growing populations and uh, increasing human wildlife conflict um what, like you 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 touched upon the topic you know a lot of people asked you are you really an african if you're uh, going to be on behalf, you know, working on behalf of the wildlife. What's your view on this whole situation of the population issue and uh, you know wildlife in Kenya, especially? 
Yeah, great question. Um, and 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 I'm gonna give you two 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 scenarios which I, I think are really important. First, I think that um, it land planning is really important. We haven't had very good land planning in Kenya. We've allowed for uh, people to occupy land surrounding our national parks without thinking about buffer zones, corridors, dispersal areas. That is something that has come as a, um, uh, I would say, a bit late. And now we're dealing with that problem because people are living in the same landscape with all these animals. But having said that, the reason why Kenya has so much wildlife is because people have always lived with and tolerated wildlife. So there has been a, a tradition of living with, with wildlife among many of our tribes, especially the pastoral people. And so I think that finding ways of rewarding those people for living with nature is a, a big part of the answer. It's a big part of the solution. They actually know how to live with nature. So that's a, a big opportunity for us. And I see it in uh, Ambaseli and Samburu, Tokana, uh, down in the Masai Mara. I see a lot of people still living with wildlife, you know, in the same landscape, which is really exciting. Um, but we also have a problem that one of our neighbors is Tanzania. Tanzania is a country that allows hunting and they justify, uh, just one second. Hey, shoot, dog is eating my cat food. <laughs> um, um, actually, if you could just give me one second, let me just close the curtain because this light is too bright now. Yep. <laughs> I think that's a bit better. Um, yeah, so in Tanzania, they do allow hunting and their argument is that uh, they need to eliminate certain animals which have become problem animals, and in particular elephants, lions, leopards. Um, the truth is that the people who hunt these animals are not interested in solving a problem of human wildlife conflict. They're in, they're in the business of having fun and killing a big animal, a big scary animal, and having a trophy to take home. And it, this has really created some challenges for Kenya and Tanzania. And uh, we recently have launched a massive campaign to address the hunting of elephants on the border of Tanzania and Kenya, the what they call the cross-border elephant population between Amboseli and northern Tanzania around um, Mount Kilimanjaro. And... Uh, that's the population of elephants, which, you know, my first photographs come from the most magnificent tuskers in all of that's Africa. That we call them super tuskers. And as a result, now we're we're having a big clash with Tanzania. We have launched a campaign. We have over 500,000 signatures in our campaign. And I hope you guys can help us to keep promoting that campaign. We're going to be taking it to the Tanzanian president on World Elephant Day to, you know, impress on her that we don't want these elephants to be hunted. So the, the issue of dealing with human wildlife conflict, I wouldn't say that it's due primarily to or only to human density, human proximity. Um, it's also due to just poor land management practices. I think I think we can do better. We should do better. We're intelligent enough to deal with it. Um, and we've always lived with wildlife. So I'm, I'm, I know that there are solutions. Thank you. Uh um, so we'll now take one from uh, Ayman, uh, who's raised his hand a little bit. Ayman, please go ahead. Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, hi, ma'am. So firstly, it's been an absolute pleasure listening to your story. It's incredibly inspiring to hear the words, your story, your entire journey. Um, so just a bit of context. I'm 17 now, and I've always been interested in wildlife. I've, I've spent a lot of time in nature. I do photography, all of this. And I'm at a time now where I have to decide what I want to do in my future. And um, as I see it now, there's with respect to wildlife, there's two things that I could do. One is the academia, the research, the more deep scientific this thing. And the other side is conservation activism. Uh, so my question is, according to you and your experience, what is more impactful? What would help more? Oh, what a great question. And thank you. Thank you so much for your interest and for your passion. And for such a thoughtful question, I always advise young people to get your academics behind you, right? Get, you need legitimacy. There are lots and lots of people who cannot stand up against um, the, the real challenges and the threats because they haven't got the scientific grounding. You need that. So my, my recommendation is always, uh, go to university and learn and become an expert in something. Once you have that expertise, that grounding, it gives you legitimacy to then launch those campaigns, which are important. If you go straight into campaigns, people will just think you're a bit fluffy, 
You don't really know what you're talking about. You're not really an expert. Um, when you have credentials, you can be much more impactful. I hope that helps. Hello, um, that. A very deep question next up from uh, Tom Demar. Cultures evolve from spiritual connections with the natural world to an utilitarian view. Uh, very true. Uh, uh, what benchmarks would you look at uh, to show a return to that connection between humans and wildlife? Wow. How would you measure? Yeah, that's a that's a really great one. You know, uh, I mean, I we measure it in Kenya on our national policies. Kenya has... Um, has always defended the rights of animals, but we've never said it. We've never put in writing that we have rights, human rights for animals. Some countries have New Zealand, and I think Costa Rica has human rights for animals, and Italy has human rights for chimpanzees. Um, but Kenya has um, always defended wildlife, and we have this slogan that they're worth more alive. Uh, we we don't have consumption of these animals. We don't have hunting of these animals for sport. And I think that's a big one, but I don't think it's enough. Um, I think, um, like like so many things, you can tell how much uh, a society prioritizes something by how much budget they put to it. So long as our governments continue to underfund conservation, then it's just a, a slow decay and we're just losing it. And, and I see that happening all across Africa. So that's a, a big part of the problem. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe the answer is that we also reward people for protecting nature. We're rewarding people for planting trees and cabbages for goodness sakes and calling it carbon. <laughs> and we're not rewarding people for protecting a pride of lions or a pack of wolves. So I think that that could be another measure is how much, how many animals we see safe because people voluntarily will take care of them and you know defend them not even just take them defend them and live with them when I, I was in um i was in france recently and they take their cows up into the mountains in the spring and they just leave them to wander and they just wander up in the mountains and then they eventually bring them back down again and the herds people um, sometimes follow them, but they don't follow them very closely. And there are wolves up there. And then the wolves are fairly new, not very new, maybe even the last 10 years. And from time to time, the wolves will kill a cow and or a sheep. And the people are so intolerant. They are so intolerant. They will all rally. The whole village will come together to come and kill that wolf. Um, and I think that is a, a negative sign. <laughs> I think I think when we have communities that say uh, we we are going to forgive this lion and I've seen it for myself with my own eyes in in Masai Mara, we actually filmed a community where the man said, you know, these lions killed my favorite cow. She was the best breeder. She had the best milk. She gave us the most of all the cows that I have. She was the most beautiful cow, and the lions killed her. And then he said. You know, I could have just stayed with the bitterness in my heart and it would have affected everything. And he said, but if I can forgive her, then in a way it's a blessing because she actually could have killed my child or she could have done much more damage. So he says, the fact that the lion only took my cow is a blessing. And I think that that to me is a, a, a really interesting new perspective or new narrative, a new framing a new framing of the issues that could be a very powerful way of inspiring greater empathy and compassion for wild animals. Thanks for that one, Paula. It's a very tough question, and I think it also is culture to culture. It varies so much. Uh, I'll let Sumanth uh, please raise his hand. I'll let Sumanth ask his question. Then there are a couple of very, again, deeper questions in chat. I'll come back to them. <laughs> Okay. Hi, Paula. How are you? Good to see you here. Yeah. Thank you. And this is as much as to congratulate you more than to ask you a question about anything. It's like your work is amazing and it's inspirational. And uh, just recently I had, I had spoken to a gathering as well. And then I was talking about how we started uh, a very similar project in uh, Trailing Wild Productions that I co-founded. 
and uh, every time we run into things where we are, where, where we run into problems where we're thinking what next i think it's people like you who are uh, inspirational your work is sort of the sort of beacon that we need and we feel it right there is always going to be a better day tomorrow and and thanks for your talk it was really inspiring especially at this moment where we are trying to figure out as to what the next step is for conservation here and what next film are we going to do is because i'm just about releasing a film on grasslands in india with black bucks uh, as a focal species and uh, i was just thinking of what next and how, how are we going to go about it and your words came in more as a comfort and was more inspirational and thank you for that today oh thank you thank you so much i really appreciate that Good luck with your films. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sumanth. I think the next question is kind of related to what Sumanth was talking about, their planning. Uh, this is from Jalaluddin Khan. Um, success came for you from a lot of your, you know, planning being very well done and management systems that everyone can learn from. Uh, can you give us some insights or tips on how you can strategically administer and run such projects to sustain them for the long time you have done successfully? Mm -hmm. Oh, great question. Um, you know, when I started working for Wildlife Direct, we were doing campaigning, not not even implementing projects. It was more of advocacy through campaigns. And we actually designed a, a campaign methodology, which um, I'm happy to share if anyone's interested. But basically, um, in terms of um, organizing it, we gathered information in the Hands Off Our Elephants campaign. We went into courtrooms. Well, first we, first we, we checked with everyone. What's happening with elephants? Why why are elephants being killed despite the investment in anti-poaching? We, we realized it must be in the courtrooms. Criminals are not getting punished. So we started evaluating and measuring and documenting what's happening in the courtrooms. And then we released a report. It was that report that really got me into a lot of trouble because nobody wanted to admit how bad the situation was. 70% of case files were lost or missing. And so having the evidence was so important because nobody could question us They because they would all they had to do is go back to the courtroom and check for themselves. We had data from the courtrooms. It was government of Kenya information. Um, so having doing that research and gathering that evidence and and then publishing it in a way that the common public can understand it and the media can consume it and then uh, packaging it as a, as media is so important packaging it for whether it's social media or television or whatever. Um, but the next part, which is really like implementing projects. So we we moved from campaigning now to producing films and then doing these projects on the ground. We we're very lucky and fortunate to have had the benefit of um, funding from USAID and some other donors, um, but also a, a donor who I think is a very special kind of donor. If you can find these kind of donors, you must find them. People who are willing to let you make mistakes people who are willing to let you experiment. Because some of these things, I cannot share with you my model and expect it to work in India. These things are not transferable that way. They're, you have to try and figure it out for yourself and it's costly. So you need donors who are really passionate and committed and, um, and really get what you're trying to do and see that sometimes it doesn't work. We did one project where we blew $100,000 it just did not work. And I was so embarrassed. I came back with my tail between my legs, like, oh my God, this project was a complete disaster. And and my donor was like, yeah, sometimes things don't work. Sometimes they don't fail, but what's next, Paula? What's the next project? So building trust um, with a donor is how you can get to that level. So I would say, keep, keep at it. Don't, I mean, in my part of the world, corruption is such a serious problem that building trust means you have to be super, super, ultra, extremely clean, you know, because you want people to believe you and trust you. Um, and everyone around you has to be the same because the moment there's a question on your record, any tarnishing whatsoever, you lose your donors. They, they just vanish. Um, so and it's especially hard if you're people of color. In in Africa, anyway, people of color have have a much harder time getting funding than than um, maybe expatriates working in the continent. So I would say document everything you're doing, track it. And I I keep re, uh, what's the word? Whenever I'm working on a project, I get to a point and I look at it all over again and I, I, re, I redo the model, I redo the model and I work with teams. 
One of the most powerful tools I use is called Open Space Technology. Um, I'm just going to put it out there for you guys. You can Google it and call me if you want me to train you in it. It's a fantastic methodology that um, gives you huge a level of uh, public engagement and participation and buy-in. And I think that's been the backbone of the success of our work. Great. Thank you, Paul. I think it's a long one that people will probably reach out to you for. There's a lot to be done. Sure. Um, one uh, question from Swati and uh, Siddharth again before I ask Sanjay. You know, you spoke about Tanzania and this is uh, outside of Kenya. I think this is a very common excuse for allowing hunting, which is uh, because we auction hunting, uh, you know, it pays for conservation of the same species. So what's your view on this? And I mean, quite often, many of us who don't believe in that approach say, why can't you just donate that money directly? Uh, then you obviously get answers like, we are also providing food for the locals. I mean, I don't know if the locals want you to come and hunt the food for them, but what's your view on this entire subject yeah. of outsiders coming in and paying for you know conservation through hunting? It's, it's, it's insane, isn't it? It's actually really insane and infuriating that anybody from another country can come to Kenya and tell me that I should abandon my traditional cultural religious beliefs in the name of their desire to have fun pulling a trigger on a magnificent animal that might be my totem, it might be, I might believe it's one of my ancestors because, because I'm hungry, because I need meat. I mean, it's just a nonsense. It's a complete and utter nonsense and those people need to ex be exposed for what they're saying and what they're doing. I don't believe in hunting personally at all. I uh, I'm very happy that Kenya doesn't have hunting. Um, I'm I'm unhappy that they do it in Tanzania, but I don't fight them except those populations of animals that are across the border. Um, in Tanzania and in many countries, you know, the idea of people need the meat is it's a stupid excuse. It's it's a it's a really ignorant thing for tourists to think that. The killing of these animals is a benefit to the local people because they're going to get meat. It's very ignorant. Um, and in the case of those big tuskers that are being killed in Tanzania, the ones that are cross-border elephants, they're actually burning the bodies because they don't want us to identify them and show that these were subjects of a 50-year research project. So the idea of the, the meat is available for the community is a complete nonsense. It's, it's neither here nor there. It's purely about money. Uh, one license is, it could be over $100,000 to a hunting company. And so they will use all manner of arguments to have their way. And they will even pay scientists to produce shoddy research to prove their point that hunting is good for conservation. And I'll tell you why I don't believe it's good for conservation, for, especially for animals like elephants and lions. Bull elephant, they, they only hunt bull elephants, they don't hunt females. If you hunt the biggest bull, the one with the biggest tusks, he's probably the... Uh, people used to think bull elephants just live on their own. They don't. Bull elephants live in groups. And those groups have very interesting social structures, which are quite different from family groups. Um, but, but the biggest bull is usually a very calm, quiet, stoic, you know, sturdy guy. His job... And you, you never see him fighting or pushing things around or whatever. He's always a bull who is very quiet and calm and generous with the rest of the family. And it's that generosity and that caring that he illust he shows, that he exhibits, that is actually why he's chosen by the other elephants to be the lead elephant. Um, so when you take out a big bull like that, who in fact controls the bulls, what you're doing is you're removing the leadership and you, what you're left with is a bunch of bulls that are not old enough, not mature enough, not ex experienced enough to know what to do when they find themselves in trouble, when they stumble into somebody's farm. Those are the bulls that cause all the problems. And then you end up with a really big crisis. We've seen this with quite a few species where you have male dominance in the bull groups and the same with lions. You kill a big male lion and what happens? Another male lion comes in and kills all the cubs. And then you see the whole lion population starts to collapse. Um, and the scientists don't want us to don't want to, us to believe it. They want the world to think that removing a big old bull or a big old lion is perfectly fine. They've passed their reproductive time and they're no longer useful. 
We wouldn't do that to human beings. <laughs> I don't know why we would think it's okay to do it for, for an animal like an elephant or a lion. Absolutely. Very, very yeah. intelligent social animals. Thanks for that, uh, Paula. Very passionate answer on that. We all, I think most of us here agree. Uh, Sanjeev, go ahead. Uh, Sanjeev had a question. Uh, he's raised his hand. You're on mute, Sanjeev. On. Great. Evening, Paula. I'm right across the town from you. You're in Curran. I'm in Westlands. <laughs> oh, okay. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um. Ambosali is very close to heart, as are the elephants. And now with the Tanzania situation, as you have put it out, and the poaching nightmare that we are facing, we have another very interesting development which has come in with, with which has been long uh, in the development. Is now the talking of changing the Ambosali ecosystem into the county section rather than the general uh, ruling. So how is that mix really going to work? And what 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 is your professional take on that? And, and, th and this group of people here, is, is, is there anything they can tell us, like anything like this has happened in other parts of the world where systems change dramatically and what happens? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. It's, um, it's not the first time that uh, Amboseli National Park has been proposed to go to the county, to the under the management of the county from the management of the Kenya Wildlife Service, which is central government. <laughs> It's a, a sign and I think evidence of the fact that the government failed to address the concerns that the community around there was raising. And we're, we're seeing this um, having huge consequences all across the country now. Uh, Tokana in Savo East, Savo West, and many of the other parks, they're all saying the same thing. We don't want Kenya Wildlife Service anymore. We want to run it ourselves. So the argument is you didn't look after us, you'd not taken care of us, you didn't follow the law by the, you know, you've you didn't deal with the human wildlife conflict, you haven't been giving us benefits or sharing any of the rewards of conservation. Um, which is a uh, which was all true, and no denying it is all true, but there are reasons why KWS hasn't been able to do some of those things. Um, but the truth is that uh I think there's other more sinister reasons why people want these parks to move from central government to county government. Uh, which is related to access to the resources inside the parks. County county run con reserves are um, managed literally at the local level. They can change the bylaws. They can say, okay, we're going to do mining. And I suspect we're going to see that coming. We've seen a lot of talk about changing the laws to allow what they're calling artisanal mining inside of the parks, which is basically local people mining inside the parks. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's actually commercial miners who want access to the national parks and they're using the guise of artisanal as a thin edge of the wedge. So I'm very concerned about it. I've heard that the Amboseli Park will come under a private management system. I'm still trying to find out what exactly they're talking about. I think that there are lots and lots of conservation organizations who are very concerned. Plus USAID has pumped, I don't know, tens of millions of dollars into that landscape. So they're going to be watching it very closely. Um, but I, I am very worried about not just what will happen there, but the implications for all these other conservation areas. I don't have an answer. And uh, what I can tell you is you just have to look at Masai Mara to see how badly it can work out if you leave it to the county. The counties can end up um, undermining the whole conservation asset. Yeah, thank you, Paulo. So, Sanjeev, like you asked if you know there are others who face this. This is something that we see very often in India. A lot of protected areas changing hands uh, between the federal government and the local governments. Um, the only solutions, unfortunately, so far has been lobbying and uh, you know going to the courts. Uh, I guess that's the only thing, and it really comes down to whether uh, people in the courts are strong-willed enough to hold up the rights of wildlife and that's that's a ever changing situation, right? Uh, based on a lot of other pressure factors, it's always the excuse of humans, economy, all of those. Um, before I ask uh, Kiran one more question, it's from someone called iPhone. I don't know that yet, uh, but a great question. Uh, what challenges have you faced as a woman in this space of conservation, <laughs> uh, Paula? I think that would be very pertinent for a lot of people. 
<laughs> Thank you. In fact, that that some of my slides earlier kind of um, allude to that because I was recently in a big workshop of these phenomenal women conservationists and and uh, I mean I would say that uh, this is a male dominated world conservation and in fact when I first started working in this field I was 17 as you know and I wanted to be a ranger and I was told you can't be a ranger because girls don't become rangers that's just in you know for, you have to discard that from your mind it's not going to happen women uh, even though I went off and I had a degree I still wasn't allowed to um, work in certain parts of the Kenya Wildlife Service, even though I was very senior. I was not allowed to work uh, in any kind of military side of it, which basically means having guns. Today they do. Today there are rangers, there are wardens and everything. But when I was younger, it was just not possible. Uh, I would say that that pushback from men in particular, they I was often attacked, I was often pushed around, I was often threatened, I was often... Um, uh, charged that I was doing things the wrong way. Um, but that pushback from men made me even more determined. So in a way, it, it's uh, it's one of those weird um, reverse psychology things, you know. The more people told me you can't do this, the more I would be like, okay, I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to do it. And um, many of my male colleagues never never reached the, the level that they could have, I think, because you know lots of things are just too easy for them too easy for them and for us women we had to really fight and struggle and in doing so we had to learn so much we had to navigate all kinds of different things and um, learn how to solve problems all the time thanks paula uh Hacha, i hope that answered your question yeah it's it's um, not just about male dominated but i think it's also uh like one of the things that is most often said is conservation is the uh, preserve the elite, the privilege of the elite. So I think that's something that we see in every uh, country around the world. Kiran, please go ahead uh, with your question. Thanks, thanks, Vikram. Uh, I'm sorry, some of my video is not opening up, so I'll just go ahead. Uh, are we audible? Yes, yes, Kiran. First of all, uh, Paulo, thanks a lot. It's truly inspiring uh, to hear the story and especially for those involved in conservation. And uh, some of my questions were already answered. So I, I switched my question and go back to one of your slides that talked about a poacher being behind the bar, right? It's so satisfying to see that. And we would love to see such things in India as well. So uh, my question is around, you know, how do we, because uh, most often they, they go spot free. How it, it's very difficult to get them convicted. Right. So um, what kind of support system you get from the legal system in the court of law? Right. So to, to ensure that, you know, uh, the accused or convicted and then tell us about uh, how you experience those in your space. Hola. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, in fact, when I moved into working on wildlife crime, um, I was one of the first people in Kenya to really go into it uh, and in the courtrooms. I actually went and sat in courtrooms and documented what was happening. And I started writing articles for the press from the courtroom because I was getting so angry. Yes, yes. And then I did a course on the law and how the courts work, which was really important. And then I hired a team of lawyers. Um, in Kenya, we have a, a really nice system where we have what are called court users committees. So you can actually participate in the courts, but we also have a... Um, judicial Training Institute, which you can partner with. And so that's what we did. We partnered with the Judicial Training Institute so that we could be um, endorsed by them to go and work in any court in the country that we wanted. Um, as a result of some of the work we started doing, we called it Eyes in the Courtroom, monitoring all the wildlife trials in all the Kenyan courts. We found many other organizations discovered that there was a lot of power in this. If you could literally sit in a courtroom and monitor what's happening, you could interrupt corruption right there because that's where the bribery was happening. And so many, many organizations then got involved in it. We've seen uh, Interpol um, and many other international organizations have now come into Kenya. I moved out of the space because I didn't need to be doing that anymore. There are so many organizations, so many top-notch lawyers now. Some of them used to work for me. Some of them have come in from abroad. And there is a very strong... Um, um, 
law in, uh, wildlife law enforcement uh, entity, not just in government, but in the private sector as well. There are lots of people working in this in this area. And that's not to say that many criminals are getting put behind bars, uh, but the deterrent is quite high that there's a lot of vigilance, there's a lot of deterrence. And if somebody is um, suspected and um, charged, they will have their bank account. So we were able to change the laws, right? So now if you are charged, your bank account will be frozen, your vehicles will be seized, your land, your titles, your houses, your wife's properties, everything will be seized. So the financial reward of poaching is uh, becoming uh, less easy in Kenya. And so we haven't seen that much poaching of elephants or rhinos at all in the country for now about 10 years. And I think it's because it's it's just a, it's not that you're necessarily going to go to jail. There's, that's less of a deterrent than you're going to lose your ability to make money. So, so I think Great. that the financial... Thank you financial penalties or the financial like the, I mean in Kenya they will drag that case for years and years and years and make it impossible for you to do anything and you when you've got a court case hanging over you you can't travel you know you, your name is being smeared in the press all the time so nobody wants that thank you so much Paulo um I think we've come to the end of uh, this amazing session thank you so much for this very long uh, Q&A session. Thanks patiently. Thank you for patiently answering such a wide variety of uh, questions. Uh, Sanjay, over to you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Paula. And uh, in fact, uh, Sanjeev Soni is uh, planning a trip for all of us to visit Kenya next year. So nice. we will definitely look forward to come and see you in person. Uh, when we do visit Kenya. So, that's uh, so well, that's I hope that I can come and see you in India before you come to Kenya. <laughs> oh, that should be great. <laughs> My bucket list for a very long time. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, please. We, you, you, you can you can name any, anywhere in India, you can name the place you will be hosted there by one of our Rotarians. Please, please do come. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, it's my uh, job to do the word of thanks, uh, as always. Uh, um, sincerely, uh, thank you, Paula, for taking out time. I know how busy you are. Uh, I mean, in spite of all that, you have taken time and come for us. Uh, really happy to have you. And uh, it was really great uh, uh, listening to you. Um, I should say, uh, you know, we have, uh, it's uh, you are talking about energizing a conservation movement. Um, well, in the name of fellowship, I think we can say indirectly we have started a conservation movement, and you have truly energized us. Thank you so much with your, uh, you know, with your work, uh, sharing your work and what you have done. Really, uh, we are all, we all feel energized now. Um, I mean, uh, I was uh, really surprised to know that the elephants have names for each other. Uh, that's that's something, you know, if, if, if at all, if you come across what, uh, I, I mean, if somebody is able to figure out what kind of names they have, uh, uh, please let us know. Maybe we should start <laughs> using them for human beings as well. It'll be very nice. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Thanks one and all for joining and uh, uh, I thank uh, Rashmi for uh, handling this, uh, uh, you know, uh, the slides throughout and thank you Kalpa for bringing us such a wonderful speaker. Thank you so much. Uh, and of course, Vikram, thank you for handling the uh, question and answers uh, um, beautifully. Uh, thanks one and all. Um, so good night. Uh, Paula, I have also shared your email ID on the chat box. If anybody Super. wants to connect with you, they will uh, they will send you an email. And uh, for all those uh, uh, you know uh, who who are uh, who are hearing about Paula for the first time, I'll say just Google for her name. You will get a lot of information. So. Uh, 
Thank that's you. about uh, Paula. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you so Sanjay. Much. Thanks, Paula. Good night. Thank you. Good Thank night. you, Paula. Good night. Thank you, Sanjay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.